Hey, welcome to part 23 of Clash of Kingdoms. We are going through the book of Revelation, and I'm Pastor Kerry, and this is Growing in the Gospel. And I'm so, so glad you've joined me. Uh, we are in store for an amazing and a beautiful and a marvelous journey today. So I just got back from a wonderful morning at church. Today for us is Mother's Day, so we celebrated moms. We had Cinnabon before church, so that was awesome. And, um, and today's passage is Revelation 19, so part 23 of our study. And I thought this might happen, but I was hoping against hope I could get through the whole chapter. I didn't get very far into the chapter, but that's okay. Two weeks on Revelation 19 is well worth it. The title of the message is Jesus is the Ultimate Hero, the true story of the ultimate prince saving his beautiful bride. I really believe you're going to be encouraged today. And if you're new in our study or if you uh, would like just a recap of the entire study, I'm going to do that in the beginning part of this message just to kind of look at the whole biblical sense of the flow of events coming towards the second coming of Jesus. So Jesus is the ultimate hero, Revelation 19. Let's dive into the message and I'll see you at the end. Clash of Kingdoms. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So we are almost done with Revelation. How are you guys doing? I feel like some of you are confused. And I don't blame you because sometimes I'm confused <laughs> in going back through this book. I want to encourage you sometime in the next few weeks, carve out 30 minutes or 40 minutes and just start at Revelation 1 and read the whole book. And let God just take everything that we've put in you week by week by week by week and let it all kind of congeal in one story. Um, what we've done is jump from scene to scene to scene to scene and you can week to week kind of lose your bearings of wait, I forgot about that and this mighty angel and that scene and this scene. The book is full, it's it, very much like a drama that is written in, in, in a modern sense of TV or movie production, scene to scene to scene, and you know, halfway through you're trying to put all these scenes together, but they all make sense at the end. That's very much how the book of Revelation flows. So in a minute I'm gonna kinda give you a fly-by summary, but I wanna set up where we're going today by talking about a wedding. Wedding days. There really is probably no greater of a joyful moment. We could probably put some that are equal to it, but think about the wedding day of your child or yourself or your friend. Think about the planning and the preparation, the elation, the joy that is celebrated when two people come together in a covenant relationship of marriage. In the first century, weddings were even more so meaningful, wonderful, joyful. In the first century, when we're talking about the origination of this letter, when we're talking about the first century readers and recipients of this letter in the churches of Asia Minor, the wedding was the most extravagant celebration that was ever produced, that was ever hosted, that was ever put on. It was the most anticipated. It was the most lavish an expensive celebration. It was by far the most joyful and exuberant celebration. Weddings in the first century, and especially in Jewish culture, were a big, big deal. They were long. There was a lot of planning. There was a lot of saving. There was a lot of investing. And so, when the first century readers of this book would open chapter 19 and begin to read about a heavenly marriage, a heavenly wedding, feast, or celebration, they would have an image of an event that really unfolded in three phases. And I want you to remember these three phases of a first century Jewish culture wedding. First phase is what's called betrothal. Most of you would remember that word because Mary was espoused or betrothed to a man named Joseph. When we talk about the Christmas story, we talk about their betrothal. It's like engagement, but it's even more legal 
it really is formally, legally a marriage. They're married, but the marriage hasn't been consummated. It hasn't been brought together. The feast and the vows and the ceremony officially haven't happened. But a betrothal is the beginning point of the marriage. This is when the relationship is formalized legally and it's arranged legally. Sometimes, as we were joking about arranged marriages, sometimes this betrothal happened before the children were even born. Two families would come together and say, we want our kids to marry each other. Now, again, that's really foreign to our culture. Um, it, sometimes it happened in their childhood or in their teen years when two families would come together and have an arranged marriage. And to the, to the degree that that sounds oppressive, put that idea out of your mind. In first century, it was not all that oppressive. It was actually a wholesome and a wonderful and kind of a God-arranged thing. Sometimes it happened, like in the case of Mary and Joseph, they were young people. When their betrothal began, we're not exactly sure. Uh, Isaac and Rebecca, it hap happened later. Um, so the betrothal, though, was this, this point where the relationship began, and at the beginning of this betrothal period, this formal betrothal period, we would call it engagement, the groom would go away. I want you to remember this. He would go away, and his point in going away was to prepare. And that gap was at least a year, a one-year period of time where the groom would go away and he would put his nose to the grindstone and he would work. I mean, he would work hard and he would save as much as he could save and he would build a home, he would prepare a place. In first century culture, often they would begin with the father's house and then they would add on to the father's house. In fact, this is still a thing in Middle Eastern culture. If you ever went to Israel with us and you drive through uh, the West Bank, I'm thinking of the Palestinian regions, I'm thinking of the Jewish regions, all over the place you see these massive houses, I mean gigantic houses, bigger than anything in, uh, outside of New York City. I mean, they're just giant. And you're looking on and you're thinking, wow, I imagined poverty, I imagined third world conditions, and you're seeing these big estates. And, and I asked the guide, what is this? And he said, these are generational residences where there was a, a dad who had a home and his home was modest, but then as the sons grew up, they all added on to the house. And, and then as their sons grew up, they've all added on. And so now they've got this entire family living in this huge construction that they've all added on their own residences to, or they've bought the pieces next to it. And so it, this is still a thing today. The groom would go away, he would save and work and prepare. He would prepare a place. He would get a house ready, and then he would come back again to receive his bride. Does this sound like any scripture you have ever heard in your life? John 14, Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare a place for who? For you, for us. And if I, in my father's house, he said, are many mansions, they would have had this idea that I just shared with you, a huge dwelling place with many, many homes attached somehow to this dwelling place. He said, um, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you and if I go, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Very clearly in that passage in John 14, Jesus says, he's using the wedding metaphor without even saying it in John 14. He's saying, I'm, and he often did this, by the way, he did often refer to the groom, the groomsman, the wedding as a metaphor, marriage as a metaphor of his relationship to believers. He said, I'm gonna go away like a groom, I'm gonna prepare a place like a groom, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna receive you like a groom would, which is phase two of the wedding. The first century wedding, phase one was betrothal, the groom goes away, prepares, and comes back. Phase two is what we would call the bridal presentation and the feast. So here's what would happen in phase two. The groom would come back to where the bride is and receive her to himself and take her to his home that has been prepared. Money has been saved. The feast has been prepared. The, the celebration is ready. All the guests have gathered and the groom receives the bride and takes her to his house and presents her to her, to his friends that have gathered 
for the feast. Are you catching this picture? Huge banquet, huge feast. The groom goes back to get the bride, takes her to his house where the feast is prepared, where all the people and the friends are gathered, and she is announced. She is presented as the bride. The bridal presentation and the feast. And the feast would last a long time, sometimes days. And they would celebrate and celebrate and celebrate. And you remember this from John 2 when Jesus went to the wedding and they ran out of wine and Jesus turned the water into wine and that festive celebration and and the blessing of these families and this whole village coming together in this moment of celebration. So the feast would go on for a long time and then phase three, as the feast was winding down, here's what would happen. There would be a formalization. There would be a coming together at the end of the, now we do it differently in Western world. We, the preparation, yeah, that's all there, the savings, the getting ready. And then we have a ceremony first. And then we celebrate at the reception. And then the the bride and groom at the end of the reception tell everybody goodbye and they go away on their honeymoon. So in first century, it was kind of reverse. All the feast happened first. All the celebration happened first for days. And then at the very end of the feast, it all came down to the formalization of the ceremony, the vows, the exchanging of the vows, and then the beginning and the consummation of the relationship and the formalization of the wedding. So when it comes to you and me, Jesus is the groom. This is the picture that the Bible paints for us. Jesus is the groom, and the church is called, the New Testament church, that's you and me, those of us who have trusted Christ, we're called the Bride, we're the bride of Christ. And so betrothal, the engagement began when you trusted Jesus as your savior. When you accepted him, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians says. He came into your life and sealed you. You became his, irreversibly his. It's legally sealed in heaven, you belong to Jesus, you belong to God, you're a part of the bride the moment you trust him. But he's gone away and he's preparing the place and he's preparing the feast. And he's preparing for that final celebration. And he promised he would come again and receive us. And the Bible teaches us about that and calls that, we call that the rapture, where we will meet Jesus in the air. I'm telling, this is all very important for where we're going. We meet Jesus in the air. It could happen at any moment. It's the next event on the prophetic calendar. Any moment, we're, we could be out of here. Just caught up together in the clouds, received by Jesus, and then presented into the heavenly scene like we studied in Revelation four and five. That rapture event is a perfect picture of the first century wedding that Jesus described in John 14. Now this is very important. That event that could happen at any moment is not the second coming of Jesus. There are two different events. Scripture makes that very clear. And the description of the rapture event of us meeting the Lord in the air and being taken to the place he's prepared to be with him there, that's the description of the rapture. The description of the second coming is what you're gonna read today and that is Jesus coming back to earth. Not to the clouds, with clouds. Not in the clouds, with clouds, to the earth. So we're gonna read that today. But we're gonna read about this wedding feast. We're gonna read about the finalization of this marriage that we are presently in the betrothal period. We're presently in the engagement period and we're waiting for the groom to come. And he could come at any moment and we're to be ready as his bride to be caught up to meet him, to be with him and to see the place he's prepared for us. Now, you guys okay? All right, let's do a flyby To get to where we are in chapter 19, let me just give you a review. The very next event on the prophetic calendar, biblically speaking, what the Bible says will happen in the future, is the rapture of believers caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Shortly after that event, sometime, we don't know there's a period of time in between, shortly after that event, there'll be a global reorganization of the world, of global governance. It will be led, it will lead to 10 regions of the world under a global headship, under a global governance. Part of what will bring that about is the signing 
of a peace treaty. A key leader will rise up to prominence in all of that discussion, in all of that reorganization politically. He will negotiate a peace treaty in the Middle East. All of the nations of the Middle East will finally be at peace and at rest with the nation of Israel. There will be a treaty signed. The temple in Israel will be reconstructed, perhaps a sharing of Temple Mount between Islam and pseudo-Christianity, fake Christianity, and, and Judaism. All three may be sharing Temple Mount, but the signing of this peace treaty will do two things. It will reorganize the world under a, an umbrella of peace and global unity, and it will give Israel the right to access Temple Mount and begin their sacrificial systems again. By the way, we've talked a lot about all these things. All the pieces of these puzzles are coming together in our lifetime. It's amazing to see, and we've talked so much about it. It's one reason we believe the Bible, because it's so accurate in its forecasting and foretelling of future events. It's 100% accurate up to this point. At the signing of that peace treaty, a seven-year clock begins to tick. There are seven years left in human history. And we call this, Scripture calls this, the tribulation period. During this seven-year period of time, we are not, those of us who are alive and know the Lord right now, we're not here. I, I can't make that clear enough, because I keep getting asked, what are we here for? None of it. <laughs> you need to get that, lock that in. Like, are we here for the trumpets or judgments? Are we here for the seal judgments? Are we here for the bowl judgments? No, if you know Jesus, you're not here for any of it. You're at a wedding feast. We're, we're gone. Bible makes that clear. You say, well, you, you rapture people are just escapists. We're not escapists. We're biblicists. This is, if, this is the most plain reading of Scripture, taking the Word of God as he said it without conforming it to a pre-constructed tradition of men. I'm just giving you the Word of God as he gave it to us. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going down that road, but during this time, the church, us, believers, we're in heaven, and we're rejoicing and experiencing a welcome home award ceremony that in one sense is called the judgment seat of Christ. Nothing to fear, it's a, it's a time when we are rewarded for our good works. It's like the award ceremony of the Olympics. And at the same or similar time, we're enjoying the marriage supper or marriage feast. And I have some split opinions personally on the marriage feast, but we'll come back to that in terms of how and when that happens. But while we're in the heavenly scene, which John has shown us a number of times as we've gone through this book, many critical events are unfolding on planet Earth. In the first three and a half years of the seven years, there's global peace, there's global unity. It seems like the plans and schemes of men and Satan are working. During this time, God sends supernatural gospel witnesses. Through many means, he begins to intervene and make sure the planet has access to the truth of the gospel and to know what's coming. Also, early in this time, or during this early period, there are some early judgments and some cosmic miraculous signs that begin to unfold, and John called them the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. Not all of them are beginning, but, um, but some of them are beginning. Now, remember this, seven years, and at the midpoint, three and a half years, at the midpoint, this figure, this key political figure that led this global alliance of 10 nations, 10 regions, and signed this peace treaty with Israel and brought peace and global unity. At three and a half years, this figure, who Scripture calls the Antichrist, he will break that treaty. He will go to Jerusalem, he will walk into the temple, he will desecrate that temple, declare himself to be God through lies and signs and wonders and miracles he will look like he will seem to be a true Messiah. He will be a fake Messiah. He will break the peace treaty. He will blaspheme God. He will declare and demand himself God and demand that the whole world worship him at the threat of death. Now, when that figure does that, when that leader does that, this begins another clock ticking, the last three and a half years of the seven-year period of time. 
Scripture calls this a short time. Scripture says that these times will be shortened on purpose. It will be a brief time. Last few weeks we've seen this, uh, the beast, the Antichrist has power for one hour. It's a very short period of time in God's overall economy. During this last three and a half years, Satan is now ruling the world through this Antichrist figure, and this Antichrist leader turns against Israel and begins to wage war on the Jewish people, who Jesus tells them, run for your life, flee to the wilderness, and God supernaturally protects them during this three and a half year period of time. This leader is also waging war on continuing believers. During these three and a half, first three and a half years and second three and a half years, there are people turning to Christ. They're receiving him. They're trusting him as Savior. And Antichrist is killing them as fast as he can find them. So many people are martyred during this time, which to us sounds terrible. But listen, this is sweet rescue because they get immediately brought into the heavenly scene where we're there. It's, we're going to be kind of like, welcome home. Try the chicken. It's delicious. You know, I mean, we're going to be having so much fun and I don't mean that in a trivial way. This is going to be an amazing, the most amazing time of your life because you've trusted Jesus as Savior and he is the victorious Savior and Shepherd and the worst time on planet Earth to be alive because everything that Satan touches gets worse. But everything that Jesus touches gets better. So, I hope I'm not losing you. Very late in this three and a half year period of time, God will destroy the capital city of the world called Babylon and the systems of the world, the economy, the religion, and the government that the Antichrist put into place. And then in final position, he will destroy the armies of the world that come against him. Surviving humans of this day, future, they will have all cursed God, rejected God by this point. Most will refuse to repent even though they see God with their own eyes, even though they see Jesus with their own eyes. And as a result of the cataclysms and the final judgments that are then poured out at the very end of that seven year period of time, final judgments, final cataclysms, as a result of this, Satan convinces the whole world to gather around Jerusalem and to go to war against God. Paul said that they believe a great deception. It's a, my best guess is that the Antichrist is able to convince the world that this is not really God, that this is some foreign alien invasion. And that if they all come together, they can actually defeat it. Some of you remember that old movie, Independence Day. And the first time I saw that movie, I'm like, this is, this is like reading Revelation 19. They're, they, they, they're turning God into an alien invasion and we're gonna, we're gonna take him out, we're gonna destroy him. And so they gather, the whole world gathers around Israel, around a valley called Megiddo or Armageddon for the final battle. So that sets the stage for what we're gonna read today. And I have like 12 minutes left. <laughs> The final judgments bring all of earth and humanity to the brink of survival. If you remember those bowl judgments, vials, V-I-A-L, vile judgments, the final vile judgments bring survival to the very brink. You couldn't survive more than a few days after those judgments, if you did survive. At the very last position of the final judgments, darkness descends over the whole planet. The entire kingdom of the Antichrist, the entire global governing system, it's all collapsed. Men are suffering, they're cursing God, but they're in total darkness. Think about this, no light whatsoever. I'm not talking about no flashlights, I'm not talking about no electricity, I'm talking about no light at all. No electricity, no fuel burning, no flames burning, no stars shining, no moon, no sun, it's all black. This is when you're sitting in a theater right before the main act comes on stage. Everything goes dark, and they're sitting there cursing God in this, in this darkness. Now, given the time I have left, I probably won't get through today, but let's see how far we can go. 
Remember this before we get into chapter 19. Jesus' first visit to the earth was with gentleness. It was with mercy. God's first plan for thousands of years has been to show grace and salvation and mercy to redeem humanity, to bring people back to himself. God, the last thing God wants to do is judge you and condemn you and send you into everlasting separation from him. That is the very last thing God wants to do with any human being. Hell was not created for you or me, it was created for the devil and his angels. But necessarily, those who reject God's salvation through Jesus are choosing eternal separation from God, from Jesus. So in the end, does God send anybody to hell? No, he just honors their choice. He simply gives them what they've chosen, what they've decided, an eternity without him. So in the first position, Jesus came with gentleness. In his first revelation of himself, God said, I am a mercy giver, I am a savior, I am a shepherd, I am a father, I am a faithful friend. But his second visit, his second coming that we're gonna read about today will be with judgment and justice. It will be with vindication to the point of restoration. He is redeeming, and so to redeem, he has to destroy the cancer of sin. He has to destroy all the enemies of peace, all the enemies of goodness, all the enemies of evil. Last week we saw Jesus destroy the global religious system and the global economic and commercial system and today he's going to destroy Satan's military system and he's gonna do it without lifting a finger and he's gonna do it all on his wedding day. He's not gonna lift one finger and it's on the day of his wedding. I put some verses in your introduction that speak to the idea that it's really hard for us to imagine these things. 1 Corinthians 13, now we see through a glass darkly. I'm standing here admitting to you the things we're gonna read in a few minutes flatten me, my imagination. They're beyond my ability to comprehend. Romans 8 says that, that nothing that we suffer on this earth can be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed. 1 John 3 says it does not yet appear what we shall be, for we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Psalm 16 says, in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures evermore. And I love the picture that is in your outline in Song of Solomon, where the bride, speaking of her husband Solomon, this would have happened in early in Solomon's life before he totally wrecked everything, he had an honorable love relationship with a bride and she says my love is coming and he's he's hiding behind the lattice and he's peeking through and I can see him I can see him getting ready I can see him and the anticipation there is a picture of us today looking into the lattice work of scripture and we see the face of Jesus we're the bride we're the princess he's the prince he's the groom and and we're waiting to be rescued we're living in the cave of the dragon right now. You're like, I don't feel it. Well, look around a little bit. Watch the news this week. Wouldn't you like to be rescued from taxes? Okay, now you get it, okay. Wouldn't you like to be rescued from sickness? Wouldn't you like to be rescued from, you know, all the things we talked about last week? All the systems that oppress us? Yeah, you're, you're, the, you're the bride that's been taken away captive by the dragon and you're waiting for your prince. And, and, we, and we get today to look into the lattice work of scripture and we see his face. We get, we get little images, we get little hints that he's there and he's coming soon. And it just, it, it enlivens our heart. It puts joy and hope, hopefulness in us. It's a wonderful thing. So maybe it's good that we'll just take two weeks on this. I want you to see, first of all, Jesus hosting the ultimate marriage celebration. Jesus hosting the ultimate marriage celebration. Now you need to contrast this to the darkness and destruction that Satan brings to planet Earth. When Satan, and by the way, lest you think that I'm just bizarre in the way I'm talking about Satan, the serpent, the dragon, and all this stuff, 
you need to understand we're witnessing almost every week as a church to former Satanists, to former pagans, to people who did get wrapped up. You need to realize one of the fastest growing religions on the planet right now is Satanism. It's the active, overt worship of Satan. It's showing up in our mainstream entertainment. It's showing up all the time in main streets of America. It's showing up in, our, in all of our literature and all of our music. It's, it's there. And it's not just trendy. It's a real thing. And whatever Satan touches gets worse and whatever Jesus redeems gets better. Whatever Satan touches gets worse and whatever Jesus redeems gets better. And so we're gonna see this contrast and John is painting this contrast of this horrific unfolding of darkness and evil on planet Earth for a short time and up against that, the glory and the radiance and the beauty of the wedding that's unfolding in heaven and soon to come on Earth. So we begin in verse one with all that set up and I hope that that all made sense to you. Verse one, and the celebration, by the way, is continuing from chapter 18. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, read out loud the rest of verse one, ready, go. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. This is you and me. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is you and me. And if you don't know Jesus as Savior, don't put it off any longer. Get on the right team so that you're in this crowd. What are we saying in verse two? For true and righteous are his judgments. As we're in the grandstands of heaven, watching all of the preliminary unfold on planet Earth prior to the second coming of Jesus, watching mankind curse and kill and bloodshed and destruction, watching Satan do his worst, when we, worst, when we see God finally vindicate, finally bring judgment, we're celebrating. We're saying hallelujah. By the way, the word hallelujah appears four times here. It's the only times in the New Testament this word shows up. It's all over the Old Testament, but it's almost like the entire New Testament church age, the whole thousands of years of believers have been holding their breath for this moment when finally Jesus does justice to all the things that wrecked his creation. True and righteous as opposed to false and unrighteous, the works of Satan. For he has judged the great harlot or whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, we talked about all that last week, and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Vengeance, vindication, justice. And again, they said, hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever, and the four, so the celebration in heaven, and the four and 20 elders, we learned about them in chapter four, and the four beasts, also chapters four and five, fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. Now look at verse five. As the celebration continues in heaven, and a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God, all ye his servants, and all ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, okay, now here, I need you to help me with this, okay? Um, starting with the word hallelujah, let's go down to um, the end of verse seven together, okay? So you're gonna, and I want you to shout this, all right? Like this is just rehearsal. So starting with hallelujah, verse six, all the way to the end of verse seven, ready, go. Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. So let's talk about what is happening here. Millions and millions of people. Millions and millions of voices. And we're talking about Old Testament saints. 
We're talking about New Testament believers since the time of Jesus up until the rapture. And we're talking about hundreds of millions of angelic beings. And, I might add, we're talking about all the martyrs, maybe millions of martyrs, that have been brought into the heavenly scene during the seven-year tribulation. All of us in a giant congregation, I'm just gonna tell you, you've never been to a sporting event, you've never been to a concert, you've never been to a gathering like this that will evoke such energy, such passion, such elation. You have never been in an arena of such beauty and glory and light show and wonder and amazement. This is a billion times a billion, the best fireworks show you ever saw, the best laser light show you ever saw, the best drone show you ever saw, the best human production will pale and fade away in comparison to this moment when we are standing together in the throne room of the universe and as we, the bride, are highlighted in this moment that, that the bride, the marriage of the lamb has come. And his wife, that's you and me, that's the church, has made herself ready. And to her, look at verse eight, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. We are, now, I don't, words cannot possibly describe this. But again, going back to the image of a first century wedding, there was nothing at the wedding that could begin to even remotely touch the beauty of the bride. She was by far the most beautiful element at the wedding. And by the way, first century weddings, for better or for worse, they were folk, the key player in the weddings was the groom. He was considered to kind of be the first position. Now that today, it's more the focus on the bride. I get it, wonderful. I'm just saying, in, in, in the heavenly scene, Jesus will be first and foremost, but then he will be presenting us. And we collectively will be arrayed, those of us who have trusted Christ, in fine linen, clean and white. We will be radiant. You say, Pastor Kerry, I don't feel radiant. I feel like a struggling, sinful, limping through life follower of Jesus. Exactly. We all are. But in this moment, all the bad stuff has been burned up. And what remains is only the good. All your regrets are gone. All the sins are forgiven. All the temptations and all the broken parts of you are gone. And you are standing there in total purity, faultless before God as the bride of Jesus. And look at this phrase, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And I think I can pause at this phrase. I'll just talk about this phrase and then we'll time out for today and hold our breath till next week. I didn't even get to the best part of this chapter. <laughs> Clean and white for the fine linen is, this is a very important statement, the righteousness of the saints. If you come from certain church traditions, you're told that the word saint is only these super holy, super perfect, super followers of God, kind of like in the Marvel Cinematic Universe of Christianity. Are you with me? You know, superhero Christians. So, you know, hundreds of years after your death, if you were a spectacular missionary or whatever, you get venerated to sainthood. That, again, is an unbiblical teaching. It's a man-made construct. The word for saints in the Bible is anybody that's believed in Jesus. It's not about how you feel. It's not about how good you've done or, or earning something. Salvation is never earned. You can never get to heaven. You can never be brought into relationship with God by your goodness. Get rid of that idea that is unbiblical, that is not the way. The way is by faith through the work of Jesus. Jesus came and died and he became sin for us. He took our sin on himself. He became our sin so that he give us his righteousness. So the righteousness that you read about in scripture that is attributed to people, anytime you read in the Bible about a person who is called righteous, he was a righteous man, she was a righteous woman, righteous before God, that is never 
a super good person. In fact, I can show you, if I had the time, direct correlation between this person's called righteous, but look at what this person did so terribly. David was called a man after God's own heart, but he had like 10 wives and committed adultery and then murder and then covered it up and then never reconciled with his kids and they killed each other. It was terrible. So he was a bad person, but he was declared righteous in the eyes of God. That's a judicial term. That's to be exonerated in the courtroom of heaven. So righteousness, in the first position, righteousness is, it is, it is conferred. It's not earned. If righteousness had to be earned, none of us could have it. Now let me tell you this, you have to have righteousness to be received into heaven, to be brought into the family of God. You have to have righteousness, but none of us do. Romans says there's none righteous, no, not one. So we have this real dilemma. How do we get righteousness if we're unrighteous? Enter Jesus. He came riding into time and space to face the dragon and to face all the condemnation that sin brings and to bring your sin, your unrighteousness into himself. And then he rose again and said, I'm coming back. Trust me, faith me, believe me. And when you believe me, I'll come into your life and I'll give you my righteousness and I'll forgive your sins and I'll confer upon you righteousness, innocence, a declaration of exoneration in the courtroom of heaven. You will be free. You'll be brought into the, the, the heart and the family of God. That is your first righteousness. You cannot have your own righteousness in God's eyes. You've gotta have his. But he'll give it to you the moment you trust him. But here's where it gets even cooler. The righteousness of the saints at this point, in the first position, it's the righteousness of Jesus conferred upon us. But then, what does scripture say? It says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So here's what God's gonna do at the end of the age. He's going to bring us to heaven. He's going to give us new bodies. He's going to take all of our works, all of our doings in this life, and he's gonna put them in the fire of his purging, holy, white hot uh, judgment. And all of our bad stuff and regrets and mistakes and failures are gonna burn up, they're gonna incinerate. We're not gonna burn up, they're gonna burn up. Do you get it? We're gonna celebrate that. We're gonna weep over it with some regret, but we're gonna celebrate the fact that we don't have to pay for it. It's a glorious thing that he's gonna incinerate all that garbage of our lives. And what's gonna remain is like purified metal, purified silver. It's gonna be like diamond cut out of the stone. It's gonna be only the gold, silver, and precious stones will remain. And then he's gonna take all that eternal right things that you did in this life, everything you gave out of a pure heart, every time you served or loved or blessed anybody else out of a pure heart, everything you did for his kingdom in terms of setting your affection on things above, he's gonna take all that and he's gonna weave it together into a brilliantly glorious, shimmering white raiment, and he's gonna clothe you in it. So, so he's gonna put you on display as his bride. And it's gonna show the glory of his amazing love, his amazing redemptive purpose and beauty and care for you by contrast to Satan's destructive perversion and dark, evil, unfolding of all of his stuff on planet Earth. Jesus loves you that much. He's gonna clothe you in his righteousness and then he's going to put on display your righteousness that he did through you in this life. So, to close today, if you're already a believer, this ought to motivate you, number one, with hope. We are getting, Earth is getting ready for war Always, always, always. Heaven is getting ready for a wedding. And you gotta choose which event are you going to attend. If you reject Jesus, you've chosen to go to war against God. But when you receive Jesus, you've chosen to be the bride. You've chosen to be the guest of honor. Not because you deserve it, but because Jesus loves you that much. It, this ought to motivate you that your righteousness does not earn you salvation, but your righteousness matters. The goodness that we offer the Lord in love 
the service, the offerings that we render to him in love, it matters. And it's going to honor him and give glory to him. It's gonna radiate praise to him in that heavenly scene at that wedding day. You will be clothed in your expressions of love to Jesus. And you will be a trophy of grace in an ocean of rebellion. I don't know if you see that contrast, so powerful. If you are not a believer, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, listen, I implore you and I plead with you, don't put it off another three minutes. This is the true story. There is a God, there is a broken planet, hijacked by Satan, he has corrupted it for thousands of years, Jesus came, to accomplish what was necessary to save you from it. First, he's gonna come back again, finish his work, and bring you and me into eternity. And he wants you there. He died a miserable death, suffering because of the prospect of you being a source of joy, your salvation. He loves you, he died for you. You say, how do I make this mine? Not by going to church, not by getting baptized, not by being confirmed or, or ceremonially otherwise. No, it's a decision of your heart. This becomes yours the moment you say, Jesus, I reject all other narratives and I trust you alone. I believe you are God. I believe you died for me, rose again. I believe you are the source of righteousness. I believe you are true and faithful. I believe you are right. And I am placing my trust, my hope, my faith in you. Listen, don't overthink it. You say, well, I don't have faith. Yes, you do. You have faith right now that that roof is not gonna collapse. You have faith that the cinnamon roll you put in your mouth an hour ago wasn't poisoned. You live by faith. I talk to people all the time like, oh, I just don't have enough faith. That is a lie, that is a mind game. You express radical, blind faith every moment of your life. And when it comes to your ultimate destination, you have to choose one story or another to place all of your faith in. If it's evolution, so be it, evolution. You've put all your faith there. If it's the Big Bang, so be it. You put all your faith there. I'm just telling you, don't, you're, I don't have faith, that's no, you're not off the hook. You do have faith. Every single person in this room has faith and you put that faith in something. So my invitation to you, God's invitation to you today is put it in Jesus. He's the only one who won't destroy you. Everything else, every other storyline is destined for destruction. That's the true story. Call me a liar, laugh at me, scorn me, mock me, post a clip on Facebook and tell the world what an idiot I am. I am standing here before God to tell you the words he has given us. Let's pray together today. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time. What what an amazing story, the true story of the greatest prince riding into battle to confront the dragon to rescue his bride. Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, before we sing our final song, I want to give you a moment as believers to respond As Colossians says, set your affection on things above. Make the kingdom of Jesus, make the person of Jesus your highest and first priority and devotion. And if you're sitting here today and you want to receive Jesus as your personal savior, then right where you are, either online or in the room, pray that prayer like I just talked about. Talk to Jesus from a sincere, from a true heart. Jesus, I want you, I choose you, I trust you. I'm placing my faith in you as my savior. Come into my life and save me today. Now, every week in Emmanuel, there are people making this decision. So if this is your decision today, this is, you're not alone. And those of you who are choosing Jesus today, we have a gift that we wanna give you. There's a box at the table in the back that says, for your new walk with God, there's a Bible, There's an important book in here. There's some other things that will help you take your next steps of following and getting to know Jesus. 
So as soon as we're done, make a beeline to those tables and tell those people, hey, I chose Jesus today. They'll give you this box. We wanna cheer you on in this amazing and wonderful decision. I'm gonna pray for you now and then we'll sing and be on our way. Lord, we love you. Bless this final song. Help us to celebrate this week as we contemplate just these first verses of Revelation 19 that you love us this much. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for being so great. Thank you for the victory that you promise us. I pray for those that have trusted you today that they would courageously lean into now this new relationship they have with you and grow in it and help us to love and encourage them in it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we have only begun our journey through Revelation 19, Clash of Kingdoms, our study of the book of Revelation. This is lesson 23, and this entire study is on the channel Growing in the Gospel, and you can listen to all 23 of the lessons going all the way through the book of Revelation. So we only got today through, what, verse uh, 8, verse 8, the righteousness of the saints. And I want to wrap up by just expressing the invitation I expressed in in the message. If you've never trusted Jesus, why not? What are you waiting for? Now is the best time. So don't overthink it. Put your faith in him. Receive his salvation. Let him begin to work in your life and lead you forward. He is good. If you have trusted him, then I challenge you to set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Let the coming marriage celebration of which you and I are a part. Let it motivate you to anticipate, to look forward with hope, to love him more, and to serve him more faithfully, to honor him more consistently in your life. So I hope you've been encouraged today. This is just part one of this particular message. Jesus is the ultimate hero. So we will dive into part two and pick it up with the rest of chapter 19 next week. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.